Welcome back to the best part of the evening. Um, I'm Tim Whalen. I'm the director of the Getty Conservation Institute. And again, it is my pleasure to welcome you here or welcome you back to what I think has been an extraordinary day. Uh, the wonderful introduction by Paul Goldberger, followed by five of the most diverse and brilliant talks that I've heard in a very, very long time, showing an extraordinary array of responses to the questions we're dealing with today. Tonight, our moderator, Paul Goldberger, and our panel of architects will discuss and debate the role of contemporary architecture in the historic urban environment. So uh, I'll stop talking and allow you the best part of this evening. Paul. Thank, thank you very much, Tim. Um, <laughs> thanks to all of you, those who are um, here at the to cap off the day and those who are here to uh, begin the day. Um, thank you for joining us. And let me start with a thanks to the panel for five extraordinary presentations. Not, uh, not to speak of yours. Well, thank you, Denise. <laughs> That's very kind of you. We heard five presentations today. The work was radically different as architecture, yet a lot of the rhetoric was in fact quite similar. I think if you saw transcripts of these five talks without seeing any of the images associated with them, uh, you might not realize that these architects <coughs> produced work as different as indeed it is. To the panel, let me say beyond again welcoming you, uh, we want this to be as much of a conversation as possible. Uh, just about every question is for any of you. Please do not hesitate to interrupt. Um, this is not a formal interview, it's a conversation. So jump in at any point, please. Um, let me start uh, by quoting uh, a word or a phrase that Denise Scott Brown used when she spoke of a situationist attitude. Um, what does this mean? Does it mean that principles, that there aren't principles, that things are only dependent on specific situations? Um, does one have principles within a situationist attitude? Uh, can you expand on that a little bit, Denise, and then anyone else join in? I think it's wrong and very dry to build according to a theory. Right. And most architects go along with um, one of the students who made comments at my first lecture series. She said, I'm an architect, therefore I think in concrete terms. Mm -hmm. So I feel that a lot of creativity goes along with seeing what's there and then working out how your principles apply. Does this one not really apply here? Or does, mm -hmm. and you see also, being me, I have, on the other hand, principles. It's such. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, it's <laughs> such. Mm -hmm. Like, um, sure, context is important. But a rather famous architect did say, a little while ago, um, for an architect, context is a white page. Mm -hmm. And I believe strongly context is important, but I also believe there comes a time when you have to have a good night's rest and start with that white page. In other words, context is kind of what we make it to um, be, in, the, well, in some ways. Well, situation mm -hmm. uh, it means, I think, that um, you have to know how your principles apply and when okay. to let them drop because they're not, it's not the right time for mm -hmm. them mm -hmm. and all of those things. That comes into situation, but also all those patterns I was talking about mm -hmm. are yes. part of a way of seeing situation right. so that you can use it to design. Oh, good. No, I think that's... any. Uh, that's in fact quite helpful. Richard, please. Yes. To me, I would say a sense of place is the single most important thing which I do. And if I look at uh, what I'm going to call really dreary buildings, of which there are very many, I don't think down the sort of down the new parts of the Thames, or whatever it may be in my part of the world, if they have no sense of place, they're probably, the, the, the Thames is probably on the view, on, well, they don't, the buildings don't open up to the view, they open up to where they all should do, which is that way, even if the Thames is this way. Um, I'm just using, so sense of place 
is what makes the difference between a really mundane builder and a sensitive to me architect. I would put that right at the top. Anyone else uh, on that? I mean, Tom, you, you, you were speaking entirely of Chicago yeah. and actually really did kind of define a sense of place in Chicago. I mean, that goes into a bigger topic. I think, you know, when you live in a place and you're part of that place, you have an obligation to it in a way. So, I, you know, I've spent most of my adult life uh, sort of studying Chicago and trying to figure out what it's all about. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that architects should actually try to understand the, the place that they're in and the situation they're in. And I think that I was in Chicago in a short period of time, developed a lot of kinds of principles, mm -hmm. not all of them connected exactly. And I think that you have to sort through that and figure out what's important to you. But I think it's also important that not everyone would come to the same conclusion. I right. think that everybody has a chance to come to their own conclusions. I think any kind of situation in architecture that attempts to censor kind of one approach, I would think is very bad. I think it, it's, a, it's an open game. And I think that architectural commissions, you get them by, by competing with other architects, and everybody should have a chance to compete, and everyone should have a chance to do their ideas. And then I think if everyone has, has a kind of level of competency where they're, they understand, I mean, architecture is discipline been around for a long time. Everyone understands some of the rules of discipline. They change all the time. But you know, I think like that whole story with Millennium Park, I think if they have good architects and they're building on top of them after each other, the product will be in the end good. And I think if you, if you, if you, if anyone in the chain drops the ball and, and does something that doesn't make sense, they're irresponsible in any way, I think that's bad for the city. So, right. I mean, I think architecture is based on a kind of discipline that people understand and they apply it different ways. And I think that's the way it's always been. It probably always, always will be, is my sense. I think you said something very important uh, when you talked about seeing it differently, though, because I think, you know, Everybody would agree that sense of place is a critical thing. But I think uh, if the five of you were looking at the same place, you would see different things. Of course. I mean, yes. that, that I think is the, is the key thing. I mean, if, if uh, the other four had the commission to do the Harold Washington Library, I'm quite certain that uh, the result would not have looked like the building you showed us. Yes, I'm Or sure. the Art Institute or what have you, right? Yeah. 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 But I, so, yeah, go ahead. But please. context is, I think, not only the situation, the buildings around it, it's right, also sure. who's the client, what kind of budget do you have, um, mm -hmm. what kind of time frame do you have to discuss these projects, I don't know, what is the involvement of the public maybe in a project. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's a whole communication or set of communications and parameters, and the build context is one of them. Uh, right. But it's... Uh, it's a, it's a powerful one, an important one, of course, right. and it should have some kind of dialogue, but it's a dialogue next to many other dialogues that sure. you're creating. Sure, sure. Um, I mean, but it, it's the dialogue that's our subject today. <laughs> of, of course, there, uh, there are many other, other uh, issues that come into play, inevitably. I think that we take that, we assume that, sure. But in a way, uh, maybe this is a question back to you. Sure. What is meant by historic environment? In a way, if you go to Krakow, yes, they're old buildings, mm -hmm. but they're all used by H&M or by, you know, like some kind of chains that are all over the world. Um, what is the historic part of it and what is the contemporary part? I mean, they are used mm -hmm. because they attract a certain, um, let's say, uh, they have a certain attraction to the global shopper or the, the tourist, but right. they are, in fact, actually built as maybe housing, you know, for, you know, some people who lived there a couple of hundred years ago. So the question is, you know, is it just like the built reality that's the historic environment or is it actually the whole program that also like is soaked in into that building? I think that's a very, very good point, actually, very good question. Because in effect, what we, we could also ask, if these historic buildings are being used for these entirely different purposes of contemporary global retailing, is that a sign of successful preservation and use of context or a sign of failure, a sign of unsuccessful one because the program has changed so drastically, in effect? Anyone else want to comment on that? I, I feel that the the notion of the function of the building as being the program mm -hmm. um, 
ignores the fact that that building, like some housing in Venice, has mm. been in occupation for 800 years. So the first program of the first client is a very small part of their functioning. Right. And the notion that sure. buildings and their activities are out of sync, that the activities change at a different rate from the buildings is a very, um, you know, it's not a bad concept. It's, right, right. It no, helps no, things wrong. survive. But the question is, are the changes appropriate ones? And if it now is um, in high volume nonsense, you know, stuff for tourists, is that bad or good? Some places it might be, you know, Venice has always been like that. That's what we know about Venice. I love their glass beads, you mm -hmm. know. And probably 800 years ago, they still were commercial about glass beads. Right, so, right. you know, maybe it's okay there, maybe it's not okay somewhere else. Yeah. yeah but <coughs> Raphael. But I would say that the, just uh, following the same point, most of the buildings evolve. You can't say that buildings stand uh, just, uh, just statically on time. Buildings are moving in yes. their own lives in a way that you should find out which is the rightest direction. Because uh, I would say some of the buildings that I like the most are buildings that have changed yes. throughout time and are able to, to keep, let's say, the true architecture of then in spite of uh, changing programs. Yes. It's also true that uh, what has been said or has been called like uh, uh, indifference throughout the function. I think that was Rossi who talked about that. Yes. Uh, indifference through functions. I would say that that is only half truth because when working in an old building, you need to find out which could be the new program or the new use. Not all buildings are available for whatever. Right. And under this point of view, to discriminate and to understand where the true, uh, the, I was going to say the essence, but I am resisting to use the word, but where the, the trust of its architecture was make something that doesn't contradict with the new program and with the new use given to, to, to them. Therefore, uh, I will be in favor of buildings moving and, and yet seeing buildings, somebody said uh, this afternoon something, uh, make a quote saying cities and architecture does very conspicuous the past. And is it quite a beautiful idea? And the past is not gravitating like a, like a burden, just the contrary. I, I would say that, and then, and therefore, those that, that wanted you know, at the very beginning to be able to put our days in the framework of a broader temporal condition the more you are able to do that, the better. Mm -hmm. Somehow, yeah, yeah. I would, well, anyway, I give the... the yeah, words. but I think it's possible to argue, in fact, that uh, the ability to adapt to evolving programs, evolving uses, evolving culture is, in fact, a great strength of a building, not a weakness. I mean, There's to, more to it than yeah. that. We can't predict the future. Right. We don't no, know sure. what's going to happen. Yes. But it's possible to plan for change, per se, Right. It's not impossible to do that. You don't know what the new use is going to be, but right. there are certain things you can do in the building. Most of them are a little expensive. Right. But nevertheless, you allow a little more room. You allow mm -hmm. slightly stronger structure. You allow a lot of light to come in rather evenly and things like that. But when we've designed labs, we think of um, the fact that the technology of labs might change and then right. it'll get to be a, maybe a high-tech lab to a teaching lab, to mm -hmm. an architecture studio. Right, right, all, right, right. And, and that's, that's a, and if you look at college halls yeah. all over America, they're like the old warehouses that were built at the same time, except they've got a cupola on top. Right, right. right. And, and that and college hall gets used for everything. <laughs> exactly, okay, mm -hmm. good. Uh, Richard Rogers said at one point, um, things are stored in, our mi your mind, even if you're not conscious of it, which I thought was a, a, 
uh, remarkable and wonderful observation. Let me ask all of you, uh, but perhaps we could start with Richard, uh, since it was his comment, what your greatest influences were that have, what things, what ideas, what buildings, what concepts do you feel are sort of formative and buried so deeply in your psyche that you're not even always conscious of them, but that in fact affect all that you design? It's a very difficult complex because it's very broad. Yes. You know, I was just, I think I was mentioning uh, the slope in front of the Pompidou and people kept on coming up and said, it's Siena. But at one level, yes, but I don't think I was thinking of Siena, but mm -hmm. it was there. Yeah, yeah. It's there because Siena is in everybody's mind, basically. That's an amazing slope, you know how to use it on people. And I think that goes through for a lot of things where you just store things. I mean, actually, it's a very good... When, yeah, I lose, when I've lost, when you lose competitions, which I do with a great professional ability, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I say, but I stored the information I put into there. The only thing I can get to say is, I've lost it, but I know a little bit more because I worked on that thing, and that's stored. So you have a continuous. Uh, I don't think there's specific things. You know, people say, well, archigram. Well, I was at school with Peter Cook. Um, I'm sure I stored more than I ever thought of, uh, that I realized in a sense, mm -hmm. because it was there, because it was all around in the air yes. at, that, at, that po at that point. Or well, Ernesto, which you mentioned, uh, you know, the knowing Ernesto well, especially that word continuity, which haunts me continuously, um, you know, has you absorbed these things. I'd like to go there half back. You know, sure. I think in a sense, if I may, Please. in a sense of, uh, uh, of place, I mean, Going out this evening with the mist around here, there can't be a stronger sense of place. Somebody said the gods would, would come down here if they could because it's fantastic. I mean, tonight was just unbelievable. That's a sense of place. And what Richard did, of course we'd all do it differently, but he, he realized, he was, he was building the scale, he realized he had an opportunity here, as a get, he realized even more before that, if you like, mm -hmm. of really absorbing some unique place. That can be the same whether you're working in, in a slum, I have to say, I don't, because it's got, slums have got their own, favelas have got their own character, their own sense of place and so on. But, you, but if you're going to work in a favela, and I think it's very interesting working in favelas, not that I've done much of it, but I've done a bit, um, because as a culture, there is a sense of place. So, and that's the key. And I, I see a sense of place as being, it's different to, to uh, program. Program changes continuously. I agree totally. The reason we like love buildings is there's no interruptions taking your point right, in the sense right. when we build our, lab uh, our labor laboratories use, uh, as we would say uh, you know, we have big spaces to make them like more like lost spaces, uh, lost spaces because we know science is changing we know that school budgets are changing most buildings during their lives and that's very sustainable will be used for many different activities all we can do is to try to think I mean, we look back, we measure against the past, we work in the present, and we try to imagine the future. That's really our role. Right. Wonderful. Any, anyone else on, uh, can you say something about those deep and profound influences that you don't always think consciously of, but that you know have affected you? Mm. Well, Hundred million of them. Sorry? <laughs> Too many to say. Too many to yes. say? Can you say, say a couple of them? Or, uh, Jürgen, were you about to say something? Well, I, was, I remember I got a book from my parents when I was 16 on Stuttgart architecture and art in the 20th century. Mm -hmm. And in the end, in the, in the back of the book, there was a picture by Eric Mendelssohn's Kaufhaus Schocken uh, staircase, that yes. kind of very yeah. light yes. glass uh, staircase. And that really caught my attention. <laughs> and I didn't really know what this building was, and it was so mysterious. It was a night view, and it was lit inside. And I remember this was kind of a, a moment that sucked me into architecture. Yeah. So I know this was kind of a, a starting point, but I had a very strong education in music and composing when I was mm -hmm. younger, and I think part of that, and uh, I had an obsession with Kendon Nankuro, who was um, a composer in the age of John Cage. Uh, he lived in mm -hmm. Mexico City. He, perf uh, he composed for player piano, so it was all very short, like one-minute studies, mm -hmm. um, influenced mm -hmm. by Chess and Bach, which are very kind of interesting oppos opposing um, uh, composing methods. But they were very extreme, um, very high speed. He could compose without the normal rhythm because it was kind of pre-computer music. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and this is something that I saw or felt spatially in a way yeah. um, is somewhere back there, I think. Well, yeah, no, that, that, that's fascinating. That makes absolute sense, I think, yeah. No, I, I think actually you, you uh, 
You have childhood memories? Yes. I, I think you actually remember things when you were a child that, that actually have potential for being quite profound in, in terms yes. of inspiring you. And you know, I can remember as a relatively young child in Chicago sort of driving downtown. So we live in Oak Park. Mm -hmm. You drive down, straight down the street, flat land, block after block, and suddenly there's this kind of dark mass of the loop there, and you enter into it, and it's like a solid piece of stone that's been cut out. Mm -hmm. and, and, I, and, and, and I think that you never forget those kinds of things, actually. Sure. Clearly, you were operating from that when you designed the library, yeah. in a way, exactly. Yeah. Because you were, you were seeing... Um, I mean, I was fascinated by that because you were defining context not only as physical surrounding, but as historic uh, portfolio, one might yeah, no, I was, say. I was actually very interested in memories of people. Right. And I was trying to not have the, just kind of my memory. Mm -hmm. Like, what kind of memory does everybody, it's a public institution, what kind of memory does everybody have of the library? And there, and there was a great, there was somewhere I read this thing, Saul Bellow. Mm -hmm. The old library had this amazing Tiffany Dome Right. where you check the books out. And he said the first time his mother took him there, he realized that reading was an important thing. <laughs> yes, <laughs> right, right. Yeah. <laughs> he learned that reading was a noble pursuit, yeah. and that never left him, in a way. Yeah. 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 Raphael, is there anything no, for you that was... I think that I like to, to, to see the, the differences and the diversity among cities. In mm -hmm. a way, I would say that I question myself whether architecture is nowadays so pregnant and so important as it used to be in the past. I, I wonder whether the clarity with which uh, all architecture reflects what uh, society were in the different cultures and in the different times, in the different epochs, if uh, that uh, is uh, also valuable today. Mm -hmm. I, I guess that today architecture plays uh, isn't so important in the, the developed societies as used to be in the past. So architecture is not architecture. so important, really. And that is something that concerns to me, and that somehow the, the, the admiration, or the, the more I am delighted seeing this diversity, I am a bit puzzled when I don't find the, the same answer in today's uh, in mm -hmm. contemporary architecture nowadays. Yeah. Right? Uh, the other thing yeah, is, yeah. Uh, well, when architecture was much more the direct expression of society, and instead having left that in the hands of individuals, of architects, art artists, at the end has diminished the, the value of this urgency mm -hmm. that architecture has. If you look at the the Gothic Cathedral, just to take the most characteristic example of what architecture means for people, at the end it was truly the expression of the, the highest thought and the, the more clear representation of what a society was. I wouldn't say it would be difficult to find out a piece of architecture playing the same role that the Gothic architecture has before. I guess that, let's say, uh, an iPad represents today much better our culture hmm. than whatever it's well, it, it certainly, an iPad is a much more commonly uh, experienced thing than any particular work of architecture. But, you know, in the, I mean, er, er, since Le Corbusier and, and when the cathedrals were white, people were <coughs> recalling in the same way, the sort of sense of unity that surrounded the making of cathedrals, but um, that was also a very unified, relatively simple society, and this is a far more diverse culture today. Uh, could it be represented even by one kind of architecture? It would be difficult to find out yes, a piece yes. of architecture because as much as we are, as architects, are, uh, let's say, more aware of mm -hmm. the, the role that architecture plays in the culture as a whole, in, in a society. I would say that the, the more difficult would be to find out a piece of architecture that actually represents what we are. Right. It would be difficult to say that, let's find, think about the, the, 
the one of those fulfilled pieces by Kant. Does it represent properly what were the 60s or early 70s? I, I will have doubts about it. Yeah. Uh, and yet, let's say, still the the, the Garnier opera in Paris still. It's was still there. its time Something in a much that, more uh, definitive way. And, yeah. and that concerns to me. And I wonder whether the love I had for cities represents uh, a way of, uh, let's say, the kind of uh, rewarding link with what architecture has been. Mm -hmm. And I would say, well, the more we are able to be connected and to be anchored, and to take advantage of those cities that are there, and the more care we have for them, the more we guarantee that architecture still plays the, the, the role and still is able to provide all what it used to have in the past. Is what you miss a sense of a common language that was once present? Well, the, the, the issue of language is a, a very, I would say that it's a very difficult one, and probably yes. marks the, 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 the split and, and the point of differences between the culture of the late uh, 20th century from what it was at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you could speak about a common language till, let's say, till the 50s. Right. Still, if you want linger and stretch on that a bit more, Still, the Mesian language still was a shared language. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say that that happens with with Khan. The, the no, way no, in which the history of this awareness in Khan's history starts to give to the individual such a preeminence that at the end the common language is lost. And yet, still the the the, the, the flavor and the taste of common language in the the say between wars, uh, they speak so highly yes, about yes. what architecture yeah. did. Jürgen? Yeah. Uh, war, actually, you just mentioned, is a really important uh, background for how we look into at history of our cities. In Germany, it's all about sentiment and rebuilding what was lost and rebuilding kind of a history or fake history or history of our memory, a sentiment to repair what was lost through uh, uh, difficult 20th century um, you know, period. Now in Spain, you don't have that issue. You, know, you actually have really beautiful, intact cities with other problems, of course. Well, and well, well, you do have the desire to overcome the legacy of, of Franco, in a way. I mean, it's not yeah. quite the same, but, and it didn't involve physical destruction in the same way, I guess. Uh, yeah, but yeah. Um, yeah. there is hope for something different, a change yeah. that actually looks yeah. forward. There is actually a, 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 an urge for a future. While mm -hmm. Germany, city development is actually defined right now with an urge for recreating a past. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, uh, and that's kind of a placemaking that is completely you know, artificial in a certain way, as maybe a placemaking for the future is artificial. But there are, each society or culture has a different way of looking at um, its pains and its desires, its visions, yeah. and therefore there can't be an, a single answer to it. And um, I'm completely for multiplicity because you have to look at you know, what, is, what works at a certain place, like what is actually uh, a, condensa a, a, a moment where things can crystallize and actually be yes. articulated. Right. The problem in the 20th century isn't, isn't uh, like coming up with a common language because common languages, once anything becomes too successful, um, it's immediately consumed and people immediately take it over and do inferior versions of it. Mm -hmm. So you have, I mean, Mies was ruined by in Chicago, at least, by his own success, by miles and miles of very bad curtain wall, in a sense, destroyed me. And I, I think, right, I think right. in the end, he knew that. But and that was not a happy feeling. Yeah, because it was, it, was, feeling. it was far too easy to knock off Mies badly. Yeah, and, and he not wanted, just Chicago. But he wanted, he wanted to have a language. He thought it, you could teach it, you could replicate it, and the world would be a better place. But, but when but, he you saw know, it, it worked pretty well. Yeah. In, it worked pretty well in Georgian London. The idea of a language, however, and when it was copied by uh, builders who were not uh, the most sophisticated architects, it still turned out pretty well. Yeah. You know? 
but, but, but mm. it worked pretty well here too at some level. I mean, if we, the best of SOM is pretty good. I mean, if you want to yeah, take a yeah, okay. common just as a, as a common language you're talking about, it, it seems to be. I I think I mean, first of all, I think there is a danger in what we're all doing here. There's only one of us below 50, I suspect. Here. Um, <laughs> And that is that we're, we know, there's nothing. <laughs> well, and there is a, there's a danger of loving the past. The past is past, therefore we have no real responsibility to it, therefore it is safe to be, to love the past. I think there's a circular argument mm -hmm. where it mm -hmm. changes so fast, we're ready. 50 years is a hell of a long time. It would used to be nothing, of course. So maybe we're not responding well enough. We're not, res and in a way, it's not buildings we should be thinking about. It's spaces we should be thinking about. If I may say so, it's especially spaces between, between buildings. So I suppose um, I'd love to hear what the younger people say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we, we, in, a, in a few minutes, I, I trust. But, uh, I think that uh, Tom has raised something that seems to me very pertinent when talking about language, and he's the. The, the presence of the building industry mm -hmm. in the, the, the built world. The, altogether, the, the curtain world reflects uh, the, the change in materials that has happened at the end of 20th century. And at the end, we are just struggling with what to do with glass and steel, much more than people at the beginning of 20th century when it seems that uh, concrete and then the coincidence between concrete and, let's say, avant-garde in art, uh, cubism or whatever, allowed the, 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 the people around the, 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 the Corvicidans in the period between wars to adjust something that put together a style, or a style or language with the building techniques. Nowadays, the, the, the glass and the steel are much more malleable, much more flexible, and at the end, you look at the latest skyscrapers, for instance, and at the end, all of them are just uh, struggling with the modeling and working with the volumes and much more than anything else. The, the, mm -hmm. the courting wall is almost a given, mm -hmm. and, and then later, and if you take, and therefore, you should say that perhaps even uh, Richard has been one of the protagonists in this, uh, let's say, new version of techniques in architecture in the post archigram architecture. Mm -hmm. At the end, uh, Pompidou could be seen as the outcome of all the, the archigram reflections and just uh, moving a bit more ahead with that, uh, it, it comes this, uh, let, let's say, if you take the, the Lloyd, you can see the Lloyd as this kind of mixture between Archie Grant and Louis Kant distinction between sure. service Servant and, and service service spaces, spaces yeah. and so on. Yeah. And that has been a escape door, mm -hmm. this uh, technicism that, that has uh, put of the most, uh, let's say, uh, required architects nowadays being protected with the thinking themselves are the most advanced in mm -hmm. terms of, of technique architects, but let's say from piano to Forster to whatever. Beside that, even the same Renkul has, for instance, is basing most of his architecture in, the, let's say, this uh, uh, unbiased way of dealing with the structure. Mm -hmm. that at the end, mm -hmm. the, 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 the Cecil Balmont the, the offer of, of just building whatever is at the end what is behind rent. And that, that means that the, the more you are able to handle things with complete freedom, the, the more you are, let's say, being against this common language that we were talking about, that I see it's really difficult to come mm -hmm. back. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's it. I, I thought of... Um, Lou Kahn um, and his, uh, he would do that for indirection. He said, touching your left ear with your right hand is being indirect. And I think he would have called, called the, um, the striations, structural striations that Rem is very proud of on the CCTV building mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that. 
Yes. Because why did he need that in the first place if he'd been more direct? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, the other thing is working as a campus planner, and you have to work out which variables you look into because you can't look into them all. And one of the ones we always use, more or less, is age of buildings. We map the ages of the different, different buildings. We learn a lot. But one of the things I've seen over and over again on campuses is that the candidates for removal, because they haven't worn well, are the 50s buildings. Yes, yes. Yeah. And that was the time when Buckminster Fuller used to say with enormous sarcasm, Madam, how much does your house weigh? Right. And right. it turns out that the, 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 there were many reasons that it, there was, they were um, too cheaply built in the sense that they were so functional that when, it, when activities changed, they couldn't be used. Absolutely. That's designing a glove instead of a mitten. That's the glove <laughs> doesn't give you wiggle room. The mitten does. Yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> but it wasn't only that. It was the, the belief that light structures are the thing of the future. So that's why I'm looking at Richard. Um, <laughs> saying, it, it seems to me that um, mm -hmm. the wear and tear of building and the needs of insulation, let alone sentimental needs of any sort, um, but those in themselves call for weight and structure. Um, maintenance, um, the, uh, keeping temperatures without uh, too much expenditure of energy, and wear and tear of light structures. And then, of course, there's flooding and earthquakes and all those other things. So I don't know why it needs to be such a drive toward a future that may be an archaic view of the future. Richard, before you respond, <laughs> if, you, if you want, if you choose to respond. I agree with what you've okay. said. I may okay. have parts, actually. Okay. Um, I was just going to say, let the record show before we go on that we made it from 10 a.m. to after 7 for more than nine hours before we started talking about Rem Koolhaas. <laughs> <laughs> I think that, that may be a record among yeah. symposia and I really, uh, you know, I, today. I want to say I think Richard is wonderful, <laughs> but Thank I you. disagree with those views on architecture. I mean, if I may say so, you've, uh, you've put up what you think I do, and then you've shot it down. I don't think I do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, now I want to hear in what sense you don't do that, because they look like a series of coat hangers. Well, I don't know. I, <laughs> maybe the answer is a series of coat hangers. I, just to take it a, a moment further, because, I mean, of course, I think sustainability is critical, and I think if I have to say probably the father of environmentalism, environmentalism was Bucky Fuller. I, if I had to say it, yes, he was the first one to talk about there's not enough energy, there's not enough, you know, sort of, there's not enough material uh, in the world to do what we are doing. We are wasting it. Now, whether he did it the right way, I mean, it's another discussion. So I think he's tremendously important. But are say. you doing it the right way? I, I hope so. Well, we try. I mean, I don't think we have special problems in those areas that you've mentioned. Uh, I don't think our buildings look... I mean, Boburg is still there, as far as I know. <laughs> and it's had a hell of a lot of work. You know, it has 70 million people a year, and it's still there. Uh, and it, so... In that sense, I don't think we're, whether it's concrete or steel or brick is, is, is the critical problem. It depends how you use it. My only thing I would say is I think we're still not pushing the boundaries. I mean, the beauty about glass is it's, going, it's now beginning to be responsive. You're going to be able to talk to glass, it'll go pink, green, and yellow. You know, I think that's much more exciting and much more interesting. And there is a future which I, I'm, I'm afraid that I won't be part of. But I think it's very exciting, and I think there is a tremendous danger all the time looking backwards. Backwards is fantastic. I love Florence. It's my city. Uh, you know, I think it does nothing like Hellenic, you know, Athens and, uh, and if I, both in an ethical terms and in uh, architectural terms, which are sort of combined in here. But I think we have to keep looking forward. There is a danger of always looking backwards. I think there's also, uh, if I may say so, Denise, um, while we could pin much on Buckminster Fuller, mm -hmm. I don't know that sort of cheap, second-rate yeah. campus buildings from the 50s and 60s are necessarily it. things I you can blame on I'm him. Talking about. So, sorry? Ivy League, they don't build cheap, second-rate buildings. They build a they? certain number of them, though. Yeah. They built their share. And certainly during that bad period, they built a certain number of them. Yes, yes. All the uh, other buildings yeah, yeah. of those campuses last very well. Yes, yes. Even the 30s. No, no, no I, I agree completely about the quality of those buildings. Mm -hmm. Just 
I'm not sure whether we can pin them on Buckminster Fuller. I, I think it was more the spirit that Tom was talking about, about just cheap knockoffs yes. of Mies and I agree. other modernists, more than, more than any response to Fuller's theories. That, that, that's all I mean. But I agree, I agree completely with you that they were terrible, and uh, we've seen, thankfully, a lot of them go. Yeah. Because they did have very short lives. Mm. Yeah. In fact, now the greatest challenge is how to make this somehow jibe with the surge of interest in modernist preservation, which in some cases is leading toward a desire to save things that are otherwise falling down. But I don't know if really buildings have to stay all the time. I mean, it's also okay that buildings go after a couple of years. Um, Germany, again, you know, we had to rebuild a lot in the 50s. Uh, we needed bus stations, we needed a train station. Most of them are gone by now, and it's okay. I mean, some of them were nice, some of them were not so nice. Um, there's a certain need, um, which is maybe a programmatic need, but at the same time, it also comes with an architecture. We had all these churches, um, these emergency churches after the war, uh, uh, and most of them are gone, and I think that's okay. You know, there's mm -hmm. a way to look at architecture also as um, a, a temporary moment. and. Mm -hmm. If they go, they might translate into something else. Um, there is a potential that you give up a space and to replace it with something else. I think that's fine. But yes. Both hold, but it's not as simple as saying it's just okay. Because I didn't say only that they do, they're not maintainable. They're very bad energy um, users, for example. And um, they're not safe in certain respects. But so you have to understand when they were built. It they were built which with, with the context they were yes, built. Yes, but now I think I'm saying that I think a lot of neo-modernism is going to go the same way for the same reasons. And we're going to say, why did we build that way? These buildings didn't last. Mm. Mm -hmm. But that's, if I may say, it's presumably because we think low cost is a specific benefit yeah. rather than long-term sustainability, and that's about money, not much to do with architecture. Yeah, but you know, it's interesting. Yes, I agree. But, 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 but you know, there's another, I mean, this, this country is a slightly different attitude about, attitude about it. At one point in time, at Yale, which had endless money to build endless buildings, they've torn down like twice as many buildings as are now standing. Like Yale's been built and torn down three or four times, all high-quality buildings. And it has something to do with our culture that has nothing to do with yeah. technique, it has nothing to do with, with, with durability. It has to do with changes in fashion and, and the ideas of what, how a university wants to represent itself, mm -hmm. which, I, which is actually kind of interesting. Very interesting. But, Raphael. But, uh, uh, but I think that, uh, it, it, I, I would say that in the past, and I regret to speak so much about past, but the buildings stand by themselves. The buildings have had uh, their own logic and were able to, to explain themselves why they have assumed such a form. In a way, the object itself... Sure. Uh, Should the thing was, always speak for itself, be was, able to? Was able to, yeah. to, to, mm -hmm. to, to give reason of why it has uh, ended up with such a form. And nowadays, it is, it is very difficult. We change the focus from the building into the individuals. At the end, a building speaks about who has done it. In the past, you needed first, and even those who were architects, were thinking first in the building and then later in themselves. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, I think that it has changed completely. Architects are, we are more, much more thinking about ourselves, and we are pouring on buildings our own demos, and mm -hmm. our, instead of just thinking in how a building should be. Therefore, that when uh, Richard is talking about cost benefits or talking about how building last, of, that uh, sent us back again into what uh, the, the way with buildings were thought in the past and the way we uh, think in building nowadays. Mm -hmm. Should we have some questions? We're going to have, we have quite a number of them, and they're very good, and we're going to go to them in, in just a moment. Um, let me ask you one other question. Um, two of you showed uh, <laughs> Ostland in Sweden uh, and the Economist building in London by Alison and Peter Smithson. Each of those came up 
twice. So I guess they sort of win our iconic <laughs> examples award for the day, is a tie between, between those two buildings. Um, can each of you cite one or two other buildings, not your own since you've been showing them today, but by someone else that you believe to be uh, paradigmatic, superb examples of uh, good design that is also contextually responsive in a meaningful way. Uh, that, is, that is neither those two examples nor one of your own buildings. Does anything come to mind from anybody? Tom? I, well, actually, the, <laughs> this is an old Vincent Scully example. He set back his building, it was glass. Right. It was configured so that the front was perfectly proportion the back was made up with funny stuff on the back that allowed that to happen. And then as soon as they, everybody else on the street immediately picked up on it and set all their buildings yeah. back, it, it was, it was, it everything was, was gone. Right, right. That it was a total loss up. at that yes, point. Yeah, yeah. And it also showed you how brilliantly contextual in a counterintuitive way Mies could be. No, fact, actually, too. Mies, Mies yeah, the, yeah. the Federal Center in Chicago. It, there you still can see it. Where how, he actually how good sets it is. the yes. one building back yes. and completes the room, right, right. turns the other tower so it blocks the strange um, right. alley that comes in the middle of the block there, and then sets the post office against it. It's actually a brilliant piece of yes. kind of reviving Burnham in a totally unforeseen way. Right, right. No, I agree completely. Anyone else uh, have anything well, to I, mention? I would say that some uh, Altos building could, mm -hmm. could be said mm -hmm. that worked pretty mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. Let's mm -hmm. say the Talo, that is a building just as a flat facade, and mm -hmm. does exactly what we were looking for. Much better than the Enzo Gutze, for instance, mm -hmm. and, and, mm -hmm. than many or some other buildings in Altos career as well. Probably is, uh, the, the, who comes to my mind more rapidly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anyone else, anything to mention there that you think of as, as paradigmatic and super? Well, Nish in a funny way, um, we were looking at the Operation Breakthrough housing on mm -hmm. this show, and that is an example to me of how we architects have completely unuseful ideals. <laughs> and I've mm -hmm. just been in Mexico City. Mm -hmm. And we went to the barrio there. You can't believe it. It goes over hill and dale. Mm -hmm. And we, seeing it from the air, I didn't know what it was. I said, they must be very small and close to the ground. What I didn't notice was that there were no roads at all. You didn't see lines of lights of roads because the road's only at the edge. And mm -hmm. then these are auto-built, built themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the thing that interests me is there is no way to solve low-income housing problems, I suspect, except that way. And understanding what it really is, if a population finds a source of income, it may be a dump, mm -hmm. and they go through the dump, and the barrio can be near the dump. Right. Now, you can start in the, in the dump, and you find an old drawer and some corrugated iron and some cartons, and you have your house. Right. And then that house, um, your children can be reared there, mm -hmm. and you then can begin to make pieces of it more permanent. And over 20 years, you may have built a permanent house, and there's enough room in the dump, rather in the barrio, mm -hmm. for you to do that, going up and along, until you finally do have a permanent house, and unhelped by the state. Mm -hmm. The state, if you're lucky, will produce the utilities. If not, you ransom them until they have to. Right. You know, because you start putting the utilities everywhere they shouldn't go. But you do and, it by accretion, essentially. And, but yeah. Yes, and it yeah. seems that's really one of the few ways to solve a housing problem. And mm -hmm. also, those houses are very fascinating. Yes. Paul, if I may just say, I think, um, either I didn't get my point across when I did my talk, but I suggest this harmony doesn't have to be by being context in the way that we're talking about. Right. You're talking about an absolute classical but uh, well, I'm suggesting the, the greatest buildings are probably not contextual in that way. Mm -hmm. I, when you go to some markets, the, it's yeah. contextual. No, no, I think you've you brought that I, point across. So there are many ways of context. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that, that by the, the narrow, we, I think all day we've been trying to avoid narrow yeah, definitions yeah. and prescriptions. So, so I, um, I think everyone did get that point, that in fact, <laughs> by, by a, a narrow definition, St. Mark's Square would fail Miserably, yeah, of course, yeah. right, right. The, the, okay. the Deutsche Bank by Frank Gehry in Berlin yeah, would be yeah, said yeah. as mm -hmm. a nice example of contemporary mm -hmm. contextual. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, no, that, that is a, a good one. Thank you. Um, we have so many actually stimulating and interesting questions <laughs> from all of you that uh, we could be here to breakfast tomorrow. I'll start with this one. In this room, in another context, Tom Main six weeks ago called Paris dead because contemporary architects can't build there. Is that how we should define the death of a city? <laughs> or do you, do you agree with the premise or in the first place or not? Egotistical yeah. definition, to say the least. <laughs> that uh, may be, that may be the... You may have answered it, and that may be all we need to say. I don't know. <laughs> Actually, the, I think um, Paris will outlive Tom. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, let's uh, go to a question that, in some ways, is almost a variant of that, um, because it builds on the notion of global architecture. How much do you need to know a place to be actually really contextual. I say that in this global, globalized architecture profession where many architects build all over the world, sometimes without ever visiting a place before they take the job. Uh, hopefully they visit it after they take the job, but that, that's a different, different thing. Um, does, I mean, most of you work around the world. Um, as a general rule, um, is there too much running around the world, sort of helicoptering into places uh, without truly understanding them? Colonialism. Uh, sorry? It's called colonialism. It's called colonialism. <laughs> yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Only by a Brit. Of course. <laughs> right, right. I think it has something yeah. to do with, with the American doesn't quiet. have colonialism. <laughs> but, but you know, it's, it's fascinating because, Tom, you, you, you talked about a lifelong uh, quest to understand Chicago. Yeah, but I, I've built other places too. So okay, right, right. I, I, I think no. I think a part of it is is I mean, there's a whole thing that hadn't come up at all today, which is the notion of a responsible client. Mm -hmm. I think actually, yeah, yeah. if you have a responsible client, they can relate to you what the context might be or what you might look at. If you're working for a developer who builds buildings all over the world and is just trying to make money, it's an entirely different game. I, I think. Um, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I think it's all about also what the exchanges are. I mean, they send all the architects to Italy to learn there, and like build in England or in Germany yeah. or whatever. Um, now we get sent to the States to go to American academias to learn what and architecture is. And soon will be China. Yeah, and soon will be China. So I think it's actually how you look at the place with a foreign view, kind of with yes. a distance. And that creates a different kind of maybe awareness or um, sensitivity to the place. Mm -hmm. It's actually more difficult yes. to build if you know too much. I ah, feel okay. that <laughs> um, Tom's knowing his own place very well mm -hmm. um, can get him sensitized already. Mm -hmm. And then what we do is we always do a learning from when we're fresh in a place, yes. we catch those first impressions because we'll never get them again. Right. And then there's another fun thing that happens. If we have a good client, we and they will do that learning from together. Yeah, yeah. And they will be intrigued in what we notice about a place they've known for 30 years and see every day. And our different vision right, is right. complementary to their knowledge and put the two together. But it's through our experience of doing a lot of that and mm -hmm. of doing it very well around our own homes. Sure. So, and you each see things the other would yes. not, of course. But yes. places, the other, I mean, the yeah. counter argument to that is that places shut down. There's times in Chicago when nothing happens. And then someone like Richardson comes. I mean, that, when Richardson built that building, it changed everything. Mm -hmm. and, and when Mies came from Germany, that changed everything. Mm -hmm. So Frank Lloyd Wright might have come from 100 miles away, but he was obviously part of the culture of the Midwest. But I think if the, if the people hadn't come in from the outside, if the fire hadn't happened in Burnham and all those people hadn't shown up, nothing would have happened. So I think you need infusions of new ideas periodically to keep a place I from mean, shutting down. And I think that's good in the end, actually. Right. I think it's a very difficult uh, question. I, I, think I agree with you, by the way. But yeah. The best we can do is to absorb what we can, but it's the limited. Right, right. right. And learn from the clients as and well learn, as... Uh, client is key. Right, right, right. Um, here's a question addressed specifically to Richard Rogers. Have you had the opportunity to discuss 
uh, modern architecture with Prince Charles? <laughs> if yes, what did you tell him? And if not, what would you tell him? <laughs> it's been a very one-way discussion. I write sort of articles every now and then, and I don't get any responses. Um, you know, this is a long, there's no nice simple answer. That's, there's, there's two sides. One end, there's a whole question about, you know, the, you can understand why princes and kings tend to be traditional because that's where they get their power. They're in power because they are there because tradition puts them there. Therefore, they tend to look backwards with much greater security than forwards, in my opinion. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I don't think, you know, this is not only architecture. I mean, there's the same on medicine, it's the same on agriculture. There is a very, the real problem is not that he has different opinions, it's the fact he won't discuss them. <laughs> okay. Um, can you tell us what, if you were sitting, if he were sitting here, ha, that would be the day. Um, if he were sitting here, right. what would you be saying? I can tell you one thing, which I have this, uh, again, I have another. Uh, he keeps on rolling out Ren and St. Paul's. Well, Ren, St. Paul's took, Ren was quite old when he completed, over 70. Um, he took him 40 years to build it and he got so fed up by the fact that everybody kept on calling Ren modern. Then by the time we got to the last model, the last building, which is not the best building in my opinion, or the ones that he designed, um, he put up an 18-foot wattle fence all the way around so that nobody could criticize him. History repeats itself. <laughs> yes, right, right, right. Yes, you can just imagine people saying, oh, Mr. Wren, this won't do. It's just yeah, exactly. out of, scale. Modern, it's it's out of scale with all the surroundings. Yeah, exactly. right. I mean, it was right. modern. It was modern in engineering. It was modern in its detail. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. Um, this one for Mr. Moneo, um, specifically about the uh, cathedral that you designed here in Los Angeles downtown. Please comment on your experience working with city officials uh, here uh, and compared to, and the archdiocese compared to other jurisdictions. Well, uh, we didn't have serious problem with the with the city hall. I, mm -hmm. I guess that we went through right the, the smoothly. The difficulties with the the cathedral were with the content of it. I, I would say that uh, it is much more difficult to do a church nowadays than it was, let's say, uh, as I said, in Middle Age, when mm -hmm. society was so homogeneous. In this moment, society is giving architects too much responsibility as individuals. And at the end, you, you need to, to give the others the interpretation you have of what the, the religious experience could be. And, and, and the, this could be is, is the way you are working with. And under this point of view, I have said many times in the cathedral, the easiest thing was to solve the urban design problem. And the urban design problem helped to me, perhaps, to establish a bit more the structure of the cathedral design. In the meanwhile, I tried to convey from those archi historical architectures and churches that I was able to interpret as conveying the, the religious experience to have some of them present in the cathedral as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Would you agree and this is to all of you, I think, that most historic European cities are much more willing to accept modernist additions than American cities that have become timid and want to retreat into the past. Now that's a, a question of many parts in some well, ways, but, yes. But I think that you Americans are much more administrating your, your finances much more carefully than Europeans. Mm -hmm. Let's say the less developed the country, the more able to provide architects the ability to do what they want to do. <laughs> and the certain point of view, let's say, there in architecture comes uh, with poor countries more easily than with rich countries. And that is the reason why I would say that in some European countries, not the, 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 the most advanced countries had been able to make the, the most daring and the most advanced architecture as well. 
Well, I mean, Spain people, certainly is a recent example of that, Spain, I guess, right? Yeah. 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 Portugal. Yes. yes, yes, Spain and Portugal. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the question, if I may say so, seemed to be getting at a broader cultural issue, and I think it was really as much focused not on the uh, issues in Europe so much as on the sort of timidity that sometimes prevails in this country. It, it is my view, obviously. You have lost the ability to, to appreciate quality in construction mm -hmm. many years ago. Okay. I always... Did we ever have it here? I always... No, but I always quote that. Okay. You yeah, go yeah. to 1938 yeah. and think about the National Gallery in Washington. Yes. Any building in the world could be built so carefully and so beautifully mm -hmm. in terms of craftsmanship yes. as it was the Pope. Right. Then the Pope. Yes, that, that, right. Still yeah. that, that, that the same can be said about the Rockefeller Center and some other pieces of architecture. It can be extended, let's say, till the Seagram. Mm -hmm. Since then, I would say that you don't value any more quality. You are going to go value engineering, trying to reduce the quality as much as you can. You don't want to spend, you are putting your money wherever, let's say, in the, uh, let's say, biological research, of sending people to the moon. Well, 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 the, we're not doing too much of either of those things but, either, but actually, so right now. You're, you're I, I, I think we're putting our money into reducing taxes, you're, you're with, but that's a different discussion. Under this point of, my experience would be the, the, the only country that actually value uh, construct, quality in construction is Switzerland. Mm -hmm. Neither Japan. Germany. Japan. Yeah? Japan. Japan. Japan does. Uh, Japan as well. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know Japan so well. Probably Japan as well. That's true. Well, we in Europe, Switzerland. Low quality amongst individual contractors in England and mm -hmm. in France. Not at all in Japan. Right, right, right. All that is true, but I think the question was actually um, trying to get to sort of something else, which is a sort of hesitation in this country sometimes to be assertive. Uh, to be assertive and, and strong and to, to, be, to intervene in a strong way. Um, I mean, I, I, I've often felt that if we think about preservation in this country, which we came late to, but when we do it, we tend often to want to preserve buildings like hothouse orchids, as if they were so delicate we couldn't touch them. Whereas in Europe, you know, they can kind of play around with them a little more and they, they don't feel that the building will die if they change a few things whereas we tend to tiptoe too much. I think that was really the idea but of the question. Don't you think there's a whole, there's been a whole layer of planning approval that's put in place in this country and place like New York and Chicago where you go to the, to the site and there's a neighborhood group, there's the people, the neighbors, there's the city planning office. All those people are, have been schooled to think that contextual design is the only thing that matters and that means sort of copying the building next door. I, I think that, that that's a whole mechanism that's put in place that actually has deadened the whole arena in this country, actually. Well, I think it's, you know, uh, Denise and Denise Scott Brown and Bob Venturi said many, many years ago, I think in learning from Las Vegas, that design review boards were in fact a pernicious influence. And I mean, I think the, the only thing that can be said in their defense is that a, they're a kind of safety net that occasionally prevent certain kinds of disasters. But we pay a huge price for that safety net, which is that it's often a very low ceiling above us too, I think, creatively. Well, I think yeah. it's partly also how you come up with a design. In Europe, you mostly have competitions and it's mm -hmm. a democratic process and it's actually public money. Mostly the money is there, then there is the competition, there is uh, an agreement right. at some point and then it's built and there's a certain power that comes through this democratic decision making. Um, I think here in the States, you mostly have a competition or a private funded um, mm -hmm. process and then right. you're looking for the money. It's mostly like private money that goes in there. So the way um, how these buildings come into life are completely different and also it's um, a different way how they're perceived actually. They also get named after people here usually, yeah. um, right. which is different than, you know, in maybe even every room gets named after a different person. It's a completely... Um, That's for funding reasons. I know, but the funding means every chair. that... The yes, funding means right. that you know, that person who is funding it also has a certain say in the process. Um, and it's not part of a communal 
um, uh, development somehow to end up with uh, a building that in the end becomes part of the urban fabric. Now, this is mostly public buildings, and I don't mm -hmm. know how public buildings really happen here in the States because I've never participated and heard about a competition for a public building uh, for a town hall in, the, in America. There have been some, but they're rare. Yeah, yeah. Richard, you were about to say well, something. Yeah, I think, well, first of all, I think there's a danger of saying that grass is greener, greener over the fence. I think in Britain, it's, uh, the planning system is, yeah, is very, very powerful. Um, and I'm going to say, I think in Europe, it's planning for Britain. I would, I, Having worked in both, I, wouldn't, I would say actually the planning system is less powerful. The, the big difference, which is a bit I'm afraid to do with your remark about taxes, is that everything here is brought down to the lowest common denominator in financial. Yep. financial. And basically, if, and I think that we've said this a number of times in different ways, if I had to be asked, what, is the mo what are the buildings that you have enjoyed most, which you think are the most successful, what is the unique thing is, the client it doesn't mean more money, but the client who understands what you're saying. It can be a, it can be a shed. I don't care, mm -hmm. a barn, if you like, an elegant, an elegant. But I think at the situation in America, which is a modern new one in the last 20 years, new in my time, that is one where you're always competing to the lowest common denominator, and that's a deadly system. No. On no. the other hand, I've seen situations where um, we have produced what we think is the right design at the right unit cost, and there's some European um, architect in there who just horrifies the client because there'll be like, you know, millions over that price, and they seem to think that that's okay. But a university has to put its money into other things as well as buildings, and a sense of modesty about what that building would, is about doesn't have to have swoop here and angles there and unbuildability there and you know <laughs> unusability in the other place who won who won in the end <laughs> we won <laughs> we lost it to that uh, guy but he couldn't produce and he couldn't get it done in sure. the budget and but that's you know, one example and in the end we did the whole thing in two weeks he hadn't done in like five months having worked here in both countries i cannot recognize what you've just said i really don't recognize Do i don't I, I absolutely hear. disagree with what you've just said <laughs> well that's we are competing on the same field that, i mean Vast number of international architects are working here. We compete the same field. Some architects are bad, some buyers are good. But, the, but the, if anything, what the problem is not whether, you know, yes, probably our feet may be a bit higher than you, but that's quite possible, which would push it up. Um, but, and that's partly because clients are willing to pay for some sort of quality. And, and where clients are not willing to pay for some sort of often. Well, the people I'm talking about are pretty sophisticated clients, and they know quality. And they decide that that's not where they want to put their money. Fine, but that, and, you know, if you're doing, if you're doing, if you're working at a, a good state college or one of the top ten, they will have that kind of view. And it's possible to work and produce beautiful buildings that way. I but to say it has to be more than that because of some kind of design idea that but who isn't says going that? to work. You've met what I don't know. I just say I don't recognise anything you've just said. Coming back to the. <laughs> Coming to, well, to I was an English architect. But I know, I got that. Things, <laughs> I got that message, and I'm sure there is an English architect. But I don't think that you can say all foreign architects go up no, and no. forget. I, I, I um, and forget. Well, American that's what it sounds like. like. <laughs> the, the thing, that what I feel is, is that the real Cut problem the here is finding a, a way of build. Of, uh, developers are very, very powerful here, and that I would agree. And they are very, very large, tend to be very large, and therefore the tendency is to continuously cut down on cost. And you know, having gone through, as I am lately going through, for instance, ground zero, the problem is, of course, you're going to get four buildings which are of the lowest, uh, uh, morally low common denominator because there isn't a penny to spare. If you right. want to do something which is a memory, which has something more than the really common, don't make it a straightforward developer. Developers are fine, it's a political structure that doesn't work. I think ground zero, you're right, although that, that of course is an extraordinary example it, because yeah. of the other, all the various forces that were acting but, upon but, it. But it shows yeah. that the government, no, the government no longer is taking the responsibilities of making decisions at that level, and part of that level, right. I have to say, you know, there is a tremendous element of if you, get a, if, if you can get it l the cost lower, then it must be better, isn't it? It may be better, at your point. It may need to be more sustainable. It may be more long-term. All those other things have to be included into it. And I think it's it is more difficult here. Is some of it that we really do not think in long-term ways in this country? Not in uh, We think everything is very short-term? 
I think that's that is a ge general idea in this country, mm -hmm. which I think isn't exactly the same in Europe. Right. Well, for example, there, there's a profession of value engineers, and we think that they they engineer the value out Absolutely. of the building. So do we. And I think the clients in those cases look upon construction costs and they don't think about operating Absolutely. costs. Absolutely. And that's one of the ways to put it. And that is mm -hmm. often ignorant clients mm -hmm. and, and people who are being, um, they, they, they have, um, outside firms to do their project management for them. And those firms have a set of criteria that come from jobs other than the kind you're doing at the time. Let's go on to another one here. You've talked of lofts and warehouses as parts of the historic fabric most adaptable to change and function. Now these are often the least designed, in quotes, and least expressive of what uh, Rafael Mineo called the highest thought in the urban environment. Does this mean that the most ambitious architecture will actually be the least likely to survive or should be? <laughs> Anyone want to? Very good question. It is a very good <laughs> question. That's why I asked it. I mean, it actually raises a paradox, in effect, that, that uh, this sort of somewhat undesigned quality of loft buildings from the 19th century generally, although sometimes beyond that, uh, has given them a kind of extended life. And does that mean that things that do not have that are less likely to have an extended life or do not deserve it? I was just trying to th think, I mean, in Chicago, the loft building became everything, right? So like through Mies and Skidmore and, and mm -hmm. all those firms, and they're very flexible buildings, and actually, as Richard said, the Skidmore buildings were, were high quality the way they were built. And uh, they seem to be fairly useful. Now, when you get to something like Louis Sullivan, they were the first things they tore down. They tore down right. all those theaters because they were specific and they're idiosyncratic in many ways. Um, and small. Mm -hmm. Did not use small. up the but most you know, of them. But you know, like the, like the uh, trading, the trade, the my, the trade building that they tore down with the, the, the stock exchange. The stock exchange. They saved the trading room, but the right. building was torn down, and that was a perfectly good building. Right. Um, that would never have happened ten years later, would it? No. No. Or the Marshall Field Warehouse. They right. tore that down in the fifties, oh. which was actually horrible. Right. And that was a that was a, a non-specific generalized loft building, actually, which was the model for a lot of things. I know. I've often thought if the Marshall Field, if the Richardson Marshall Field building had been saved in Chicago, those would be like the hottest condos in the <laughs> Western world or something clearly, at this point. Clearly, right, right. clearly. So, I mean, that was built like a bunker. I mean, that had right. amazing constructive qualities. Uh, I don't know. We, right. we had an experience with the Furnace Fine Arts Library, mm -hmm. which yes. you would think was unchangeable, unalterable in use. And when we did its renovation, it took the computer revolution in libraries in its stride, mm -hmm. partly because it had a variety of different kinds of spaces. Right, right. So it doesn't have to be that it's, a, it's only a loft kind of building that can change, but it's a little surprising when you find one of those others can. I remember you told me many years ago that uh, early on, long before renovation of the Furnace Library at Penn was contemplated, that you and Bob discovered that you were the only people on the faculty who wanted to save it, and everybody else wanted to tear it down at a certain point. It, it was my first faculty meeting mm -hmm. when I changed from being a student to being a faculty member, right. and right. I made an impassioned plea because it was scheduled on the campus plan to be torn right. down. It was right. Victorian. Everyone thought that was terrible. Right. And so I... I'd seen similar buildings in England, and I said, mm -hmm. look, these are wonderful buildings. And so this young man came up to me and said, I want you to know I agreed with everything you said. And my name's Robert Venturi. And the first thing I said uh -huh. to him was, well, then why didn't you say something? <laughs> <laughs> and the rest is history. <laughs> um, there is uh, one question raises something that we have uh, not discussed at all today, interestingly, which is the uh, Secretary of Interior standards in this country for historic preservation. Um, and the question is, well, more, as if we needed more, thank you. Uh, the question is, uh, 
whether the Charter of Venice and the, then the Secretary of the Interior standards in this country, uh, which call for um, new things not being designed to mimic the old, um, but for some clear distinction between then and now. Uh, have, that, have these things done more harm than good, is the question. Anyone want to comment on them? In yeah, I think it's a form of censorship, and it's bad. Mm -hmm. I mean, the standards are a form of yes. censorship, right. Okay. Or, or at least of rather simplistic um, judgment, right? Yeah. yeah. But yeah. something we also f um, experience in Berlin, and you actually think that, yes, Berlin you know, is kind of looking for rebuilding as kind of a, a historic fabric, or you know, a fabric that kind of tries to be a normal city again. But the landmark department clearly goes towards um, recognizing the different layers of history. And mm -hmm. they would be very mm -hmm. sensitive if something tries to look old while it's actually from, from a different right. period. Mm -hmm. And I actually like that idea. Yeah, but if you think of like a place like Chicago, when does the old start and the new begin? Like it's all new. I mean, it's all. But in the way, you can, I mean, it always, yeah, the street always will, be, always will be new. Because even if you try to represent something old, it's an interpretation of right. what has been there before. That's true. Right. Good. Good. Um, we haven't used the word facadism much today, if at all. How does the panel address the issue of facadism? Is there any value in saving only the first few inches of a, or feet of a facade? I think actually that did come up a couple of times in a couple of the presentations, but not at length. Um, is there any value in doing that, or is it utterly uh, false, uh, hypocritical, what have you? In general, I would be against that. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, thinking and building only as an outer face doesn't keep, let's say, some kind of integrity that seems mm -hmm. to be mm -hmm. intrinsic to what the, the building is. And therefore, I would say that keeping only the facade doesn't make so much sense. Mm -hmm. It's actually decontextualization. Absolutely. Because you remove the building and all you're left with is the skin. It's obviously the opposite of what... Right, right. It gives the architect and the developer an excuse but it's a terrible excuse. In other words, I, I should have to preserve the facade. It it's lets right. them sort of essentially wrap themselves yeah, in yeah, a certain kind right. of sanctimony as, as if they preserve something when they're in fact doing the opposite. Oh, is what so. you're saying, I think, right? Yeah, yes, right. right. Okay. Uh, but also, you also yeah. have the, the opposite direction that the building actually continues working as it worked before and the facade gets replaced. Um, mm -hmm. That's mostly according to new regulations when it comes to climate um, mm -hmm. uh, and insulation issues and right. performance sure. Uh, in, sure. in, in terms of maintenance and uh, costs. Sure. And that's in maybe a completely different direction. Um, I think it's, uh, and the facade also talks about something different than maybe what the interior is. I wouldn't say in general it's something bad. It depends how you actually treat that um, skin envelope idea of a building and it can reflect in a completely different way into mm -hmm. the interior. It's mostly mm -hmm. done in a bad way, yes, that's true, but um, to say it's bad in general, I don't think that's the case. And we saw good examples too. I mean, your bullfight ring is kind of, yeah. that's that thing, right? But yeah, but I think on the overall, um, you know, it's a sort of, you, it's a touching your hat. It doesn't get to the problem. You, in, in the majority, I would say. I think it's a situationist. Um, yes. And we, yes. we recently did just that for the Curtis um, new building. Mm -hmm. There were two um, townhouses, one on either side, and a, a very poor 1950s building that should come down. Mm -hmm. And we very carefully maintained those facades, but used small scale spaces behind them and the big rehearsal room um, mm -hmm. in the middle section, and the whole thing is in red brick. So the red brick of the old houses and then the red brick of the new, and they, they, they wave nicely together. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, I, th I think it was the right thing to do there, but also it meant that the community who were all ready to be up in arms became much more supportive. Great. Now there were a few people who said, why didn't we do a neo-modern um, 
solution. A neo modern or a neo Georgian? Neo, neo modern. Neo modern. Yes. Okay. Sort of, uh, Inga Saffron said we had not caught the spirit of the moment and we had not done a neo modern. <laughs> well, we oh, no we're back to the zeitgeist all. again. Yes. yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. no, probably we didn't uh, emphasize as much as we should the, the, the fact that in the field we are talking about. It's almost impossible to give general recipes or general yes. norms. In a way, admit this uh, specific condition case by case uh, probably prevents or just you are just giving a very broad, uh, let's say, right. opinion. But uh, of course, each case consideration, any case is the same than the other, probably, or very difficult. Which is where we began, in fact, with that very, with that very issue, I think. That, that, uh, I think if there's any conclusion we can come to with a day like today, it's that there are no formulas for this, right? There are no, uh, the situations are different, clients are different, programs are different, and physical contexts are, are really all circumstances, in fact, are different and can't be generalized about. Um, we're, Almost out of time. Let me just, uh, before we conclude, ask you a couple of others that um, speak to some of these issues. Uh, one involves competitions, which we touched on earlier. Uh, the questioner asks, are they conducive to uh, good responses and sensitive responses to historic context, or can they be a force pushing in the other direction? Competitions? Competitions, yes. Uh Unlike Jürgen, I feel that um, there's a lot of, there's a good case to be made against competitions. Mm -hmm. okay. First of all, at the very time when you should be most closely consulting with your client, you can't talk to them. Right. And then you form something that you love, and then the client says, we just can't do this. And, and then it's very hard for you to change because you've gone through that You're whole falling in, in love this. with yeah, this yeah, right. thing okay. and you found the perfect combination and then the mm -hmm. client comes in. And no matter how much they try to give you good information beforehand, it's not enough. So for complex buildings, I think that's one good reason. Mm -hmm. Another reason that's our experience that um, people love what we do and hate what we do, and mm -hmm. it's half and half. Mm -hmm. And we always break up the jury, and then they choose their second best, and they get yeah. a bland <laughs> building. Uh, I'm not surprised if that, if that may have happened, yes, from time, no, but, from but time to time, yes. I, I, I believe that competitions uh, help young architects to have Absolutely. one door, and that therefore that should be open. And yet, my experience is that, as uh, Denise just said, to be a jury and to make the, the right decision is extremely difficult. The other thing is uh, that could sound as uh, dangerous, but the uh, competition shouldn't leave the, the institution that calls for it just committed with the project because mm -hmm. the juries can do mistakes and they very often do. And therefore, as much as I would be in favor for allowing young architects to, to emerge, mm -hmm. I will try to protect those who are calling to, right. for competitions to coincide what, what the jury what what the jury have chosen. What don't that well, you well, you're, you're looking at at least one young architect who emerged out of a competition at the end of the group here and uh, others at different points well, as well. Well, three of the projects yeah. I showed tonight, were today, competitions? were competitions, ah, okay. yes. So, so they haven't actually always done you a disservice then. But except, you know, I could yeah. say on two of them, the people wanted us, I suspect, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in the first place. I think there's also a great difference between the open competition mm -hmm. uh, which has the advantage of um, allowing new and inexperienced younger people in, uh, but the disadvantage of uh, forbidding all dialogue between client and yeah. architect. There's a great difference between that system and what I've seen much more of in recent years, which is a very limited invited competition uh, in which a few architects are asked to submit schemes, hopefully paid, and 
allowed some degree of dialogue during the process. But there's also, I mean, yeah. you can say that every competition is good. Uh, there are professional right. architects right. who professionally are become jury members, and yeah, 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 you know, yeah. they go from like one competition to the other. And um, it's sometimes there's also there are officers who are organizing competitions. So there's a whole yeah. structure and a network, and maybe a, also a lobby competition groups. industry basically there's a that competition has grown industry. up. Yes, so yes, yes. very, very often. The bad results is because the jury is not so great, and mm -hmm. um, they mm -hmm. try to choose again the uh, easiest solution for the client, maybe for the city, for sure, sure, um, sure. something you know that's safe. Yeah. But if it happens that there is an interesting jury and they try to be adventurous also for architecture, then it's uh, lucky. Parasol was a, a competition, yeah. right? Yes. Yeah. So there's another. But it is it is hard to enter the profession as a young person. I think that there's no denying that that is a better way than having to work for some firm for half your life and then struggle for the to next To win a half competition is better than detailing doorknobs and <laughs> yeah. office. Waiting for the bus to die. Yeah. Waiting for the bus <laughs> to die, right, exactly. Exactly, exactly. exactly. Good. good, good. But it's, if I may say, I mean, there are many, many types of competitions. Uh, and I think it's, and, and I agree with that. The real problem of competition is that it, it doesn't have the one really key thing is the moment when you have exchange of ideas with right. the client and so on. Having said that, there are many types. I spent a lot of time trying to draw up for the RIBA and so on, drawing reports for competitions. I mean, many competitions have got no architects in sight, or maybe they have one sort of totem architect on the other side. Mm -hmm. That means it'll be good or bad, but it's not a good thing. It, there needs to be a really clearly defined structure for different types of competition, for different, uh, different types of people. I think in, in Europe, there's a vast number of competitions, and I'm going to say probably most senior architects don't <laughs> enter them because they're too expensive. But for people who do it right. in their bedrooms, and I mean it positively, not small area, small area, they're terrific. That's a way of getting through. Right. Okay. Good. Good. We are getting beyond, I think, 10 hours at this now. Um, so uh, I think we should begin to to wrap it up. One thing that we all agree on is that there are no formulas and no, no simple and across the board answers to these situations. Um, I do want to ask if any of you want to uh, wrap up with any particular remarks or comments or things that you feel at the end of this very stimulating and remarkable day are still unsaid. I would like to see more and more that what we do has as an inevitable frame, or at least in, in many of the cities where I have worked, and does the, the buildings so, the, the, let's say, merge with, with the idea of designing the city as well, as, as once, that, that I would like to take advantage of this uh, awareness of what the city means right. to protect what I do as an architect. That's Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else uh, want to make a concluding well, comment? I was up here for the first time today at the Getty, and I remember it being built and decided to be built when I was a student still, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it felt really historic to me when I got here. Um, it felt kind of from a different time and different place. And I would be curious if there is an addition to that kind of harmonic composition that you have up here, what that would mean, like building in this historic environment of the Getty, um, the Richard Meyer. It's a wonderful the question. Richard That's Meyer a wonderful design. question. Yes. What would one do in the Getty, actually? Yes, yes. Um, we should have actually put that to all of you uh, at, at the beginning and asked you to show your... It kind of feels uh, like it has show, to happen Show your, your addition to the Getty, yes. That would have been wonderful. It has to happen soon. Right. Next, <laughs> next year when this symposium reconvenes, we'll make that the, uh, the theme. Uh, Richard, I, yes. Yeah. I think, again, the, the, I'm all for being positive. I mean, obviously, one of the things that the States has got is organizations like the Getty. There are private clients which have a much greater understanding of what the needs of uh, the less well-off, if we say, and institutions that are less well-off than we have an equivalent in Europe. In Europe, where basically it usually is filled in by the government, here it's filled in by individuals. I think the government is very important because it gives you a greater base. I mean, it's more, dis the, 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 it's more distributed, the money is more distributed in that way. Having said that, you do a lot at that private level, at that top yeah. level. And this is a fantastic example. God knows which one would do. Whilst Richard Meyer is alive, I don't know what you would do. <laughs>
<laughs> well, I think may, may, maybe you build a little classical building and pretend it was here first. <laughs> Something like that. So, you know, sort of reverse chronology. <laughs> uh, Tom? Yeah, I, well, I, I, I was, uh, I'll tell you an anecdote, right? I, at one point, when I was beginning to sort of be involved with the Yale's thing, there was an old guy in facilities, and he said, mm. he said you know, in a university, there's a small percentage of people who think you shouldn't change anything. It should be exactly the same it is in 100 years. And then there's, at the other end, there's a small group that wants to change everything and, and doesn't like anything here. So in the middle is where most people are, and it's a negotiation. I think yeah, it's situational. Right. I, and there's a client, and it's a different situation every time. Um, I think, you know, there's all kinds of issues that knock things off track. And I think that every situation is so specific that it requires a good architect to solve the problem. And I, and I think it, is, it has nothing to do with overriding principles right. necessarily. I think it's all about personal judgment and, and that comes from working in architecture for a while and having some kind of idea about what you think architecture is. And I think there's a common enough base in architecture that you will get some kind of consensus out of that. So I would like to think that was true. Denise, would you like the last word? Although, having put the word situationist on the table, you, in effect, have the last word anyway. But uh, well, please do. Put another word on the table. Conviviality. Yeah. This has been a really very convivial and lovely conference from that point of view. Um, I don't know who's there in the audience. You might have thought we were all, except one, a group of old fogies. <laughs> <laughs> but you've been very nice, and um, the, the people here who organized it have been particularly right. nice yes. and enthusiastic to do it, and there's been a nice atmosphere around all of this. I, and I yeah. want to say thank I, you. I very all much all agree. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I do as well, and as I said when I began this morning, we're all in great debt to the Getty Conservation Institute for conceiving of this as well as doing all the hard labors to to bring it about. Um, please join me in thanking Richard Rogers, Tom Beebe, Jurgen Mayer H, Denise Scott Brown, and Rafael Mineo, and thank you all for being here. Thank you. <laughs>